bit more. If you would like to, please stand as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done for praise. Community Church. How y'all doing? In case you haven't noticed, we've got our worship band from the youth. And Pastor Rick, nice job pulling all this stuff together. And Miley, is, so if you ever want to hear them play, just come on Wednesday night up to the youth room. And we also have today, the reason they are up here is because our missions team is down in Mexico building the house. So we're going to pray for them in a little bit. Um, 
there is a connect card that looks like this on the screen right in the seat back in front of you. If um, you're new here and want to get connected, just fill that out, uh, drop it off in the offering box or at, in the lobby at the information table. We would love to get you connected. And as well, the next slide is of a QR code that you'll see in the bathrooms, in the hallways, in the lobbies. Um, this is just to scan this, and you can sign up for the emails that we send out every Saturday night. So the announcements come on an email. All the announcements for the week, that everything going on that you need to know. Um, so we're not going to take time during the services to really go over much of those. Uh, but one that you need to know about is next, and that's the Passover Seder. If uh, next Sunday, leading worship for us is Brian Stavali. So he's, him and his wife are going to be doing the Seder for us, and he came before. Remember the funky glasses? And he blew the shofar. Uh, so they basically, they have 12 churches in Israel, and they've just launched their first Los Angeles church, and that's what they're doing here. So it's kind of cool. They're going to be leading the Seder. He's going to lead with uh, Israeli type of music uh, next Sunday, which will be fun. So um, if you know anyone that's interested in that, invite them to come. And the Seder, just so you know, we need to know if you're coming, like you need to sign up like this week because it, it's going to change a lot of things depending on who's in or out. So uh, just don't delay on that. That's all. And do we have a, a video? So this was shot yesterday in Mexico. Enjoy. Hello, CB Community Church. This is Ensenada, Mexico. This is some of the paint we've been... So Tamara uh, talked to her this morning. She said everything is going smoothly so far. They're just they're praying for a big impact on this family when they get them stuff. And um, yesterday, w one of the boys in the family is um, handicapped. He can't walk. And they got him a wheelchair. And he was, she said the look on his face was like, oh, he got in it. He was just so stoked, man. So really cool. So let's, uh, would you stand with me and let's pray this morning for their... Um, finishing up of the trip today, and they're safe for term. Lord God, we just come before you and thank you so much for, um, for this team that you assembled, God. We just thank you so much for providing the funds and the time uh, these people have taken away from their work and other things. And God, we just pray for a powerful impact, Lord God, an impact on this family. We just really pray, God, that you would, would really move through the power of your Holy Spirit to touch to touch the hearts of these family members, that they would come to know you in a personal way and that they would live the rest of their lives along your side. So God, we just pray for today, which is normally a really cool day where they finish things up and they shop for some things to bless the family with as well. And we just pray that you would uh, bring everyone home safely, God. Would you set your angels around their vehicles as they come back across the border, which can be challenging these days. And so we just ask your blessing upon that, Lord. We thank you so much for all that you're doing down there. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Wow, doesn't that video make you want to cry, like enjoy? Ugh, gets me. And that's what our church is doing as a family. So thank you for everything that you give to us. They're using what God has given them to make a garden really, really neat. <laughs> Sing this out with me. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together 
And every desire is now satisfied here in your life. Oh, there's
we build our house on Jesus Christ, he says that we are wise builders and that we have a firm foundation that will never fade away, that he is stable. And if there's anything in your life that's let you down or broke its promises, Jesus won't do that ever. And he's proven his faithfulness since the beginning of time. And I just pray that encourages you as we sing this next song. Christ is my firm foundation. We were waiting with a 
Shipping with us, you may be seated. Well, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how many of you like uh, reality shows. Anyone? Oh, because what are some of your favorite shows? Andy? Oh, little people, a lot of them. Sheesh. What else? Survivor. Survivor. All right, Survivor. What is it? Wicked Tuna, okay. Yeah, yeah, those are, I've seen that show, actually. <laughs> They're huge. I know Big Mike is a big fan of The Bachelor, so. <laughs> Let's see if he's watching these online, right? <laughs> well, this morning in our text, as we've been walking through the life of David, we have got a, a seriously a perfect pilot for a reality show happening because you've got two guys and one girl, all right? One of the guys is a foolish, uh, really wealthy dude, and the girl is, of course, very attractive and smart, and the other guy is very handsome and totally ticked off at the rich dude who's a jerk. So this is this, and they're both going for this girl, all right? This is interesting, isn't it? Chapter 25, 1 Samuel. Are you ready? Here we go, verse 1. It says, now Samuel died, the prophet Samuel died, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved uh, down into the desert of Paran. Next slide. So let's see where Paran is. Next slide. And the one after that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this here's the desert of Paran down here. And this is where the, the situation is going to happen is going to take place now. Jerusalem is right about here. So the further south you get, this is nasty, nasty desert. Look at what it looks like. Plush, right? <laughs> All right, so David goes down into this desert of Paran, and then he's going to interact in between Carmel and this area. And we're going to see what happens here now. Um, this show I have entitled... Uh, Taking revenge or making amends. That, that's the reality show. You've got to decide whether you're going you're gonna to take revenge or you're going to make amends because we always have a choice. When situations come up, you're getting stuff with your friends and things aren't going great, you always have a choice whether you're going to take revenge on them or you're going to make amends with them. Amen? We always have that choice. So here we go. Actor number one, the rich 
fool. Write that down. He is a rich fool. Verse 2 says, a certain man in Mon, uh, who had property there in Carmel, was very wealthy. We've got a wealthy man. He had 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep which he was shearing at the time in Carmel up north. And then it says, um, the, the man was harsh and badly behaved. All right? Not a nice guy. Pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. That's his name, Nabal. He is just like his name, for his name is fool, and folly goes with him. Now, first of all, I want to ask why his mother named him fool. <laughs> I, I don't... You know, even Mephibosheth is better than that, right? Uh, so David says to Nabal in verse 7, he says, uh, Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time for you. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them at all. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. In other words, we didn't take anything and we protected your shepherds. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. So in the Middle East, there's, cult, there's a customs with, um, with protecting flocks, right? Because you move them around and you borrow other people's land at time and at different times and you do things. But it was, there was nothing set in stone like in writing. There were no contracts. It was simply honor system. You remember the old westerns where the guys are like that? He says, I give you my word. And the guy goes, okay. And it's all done, right? Uh, just by giving your word, if I give you my word, that's like I signed a mortgage, like 35-page mortgage docs, right? That's what it was like back then. Don't you wish it was that way today? Oh, my gosh. I give you my word. So, so David is just going to Nabal saying, hey, we took care of your shepherds. Now my men are getting a little hungry. Hey, how about a little, uh, how about a little help here? And it's very interesting. Verse 8, the next verse says, therefore, David is talking. Therefore, be favorable toward my young men. Since we come at a festive time, please give your servant and your son David whatever you can find for them. Now notice, David graciously does not ask, really. He's not demanding anything. He's simply posing the question, I've got to look out for my men. They're hungry. We need some supplies. We helped you guys out. I scratched your back. How about you scratch ours a little? He's just laying it out, right? He's not demand- Could he have demanded? Yeah. Oh, he's got a 600-man army. I mean, that's no problem for one guy and some shepherds, right? Uh, so here's Nabal's reaction. Why should I? <laughs> right? He, he's a jerk of a guy, I guess. Uh, why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from uh, who knows where? David's reaction. Verse 13, David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. (laughs) So they did, and David strapped on his as well. About 400 men went up with David, and they left 200 back to watch the supplies. All right, so this is getting, we always have a choice when when conflict comes, you have a choice. Are you going to defuse the situation, or are you going to escalate the situation, right? We always have that choice. Let me give you three choices three choices in conflict resolution that we typically gear toward. Two of them are not real healthy, okay? The first one is you walk out, and that's prevalent today. You withdraw. You just, nope, I'm not even going to talk about it. You just, I'm out of here. This type does not care about the relationship. They just don't. They're out of here. You know, today in our culture on, on college campuses, back when the last presidential election and then the pandemic, you see the students started a movement called the walk-away movement. If any, like, conservative starts talking to a liberal, the liberals just walk away. No, oh, no, 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 bug. you guys walk away, walk away. So they would set up conservative uh, tables on campus, and they would want to discuss the topics. And they just started this walk-away movement, so there's no discussion. How about cancel culture? Yeah, that's a, I- I'm walking out. I just walk out, dude, cancel you. I'm not, no, no discussion. We're just, we're leaving, okay? It's the easiest and the biggest cop-out to walk out. Doesn't take much effort, right? Number two, we, uh, if you don't walk out, you might hit it out. That's like waging war. This type doesn't care about the relationship either. Um, I had a, I was a youth pastor at a church called Mariners in Irvine, Newport Beach area. 
And uh, it looks like Disneyland if you go. There's cr- lakes and creeks and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I was a youth pastor there, and one of my guys on my staff lived on the peninsula in Newport Beach. And I remember going into his uh, Saturday morning, we'd go into his uh, condo, and he's on the upstairs unit, and so he had a high vaulted ceiling. And I'm like, dude, this is so rad. He literally, on the vaulted ceiling, he literally bolted a real basketball hoop up there with the backboard, the whole thing. So we're in there, he goes, yeah, try it. Real basketball. We're in his condo shooting hoops. It was the bomb until the guy from downstairs came up, <laughs> and I answered the door, and the guy goes, who, who's, who is here? Is this your place? No. Uh, no. It's, I say, hey, it's for you. And he goes up to the door, and the guy goes, what the blankety blank are you guys doing up there? You're knocking all the stuff, not stuff, off the walls. So my friend had a choice. He chose wrongly. His response literally was, well, I know I shouldn't be asking this, but why would you hang stuff on the walls? <laughs> that started them going back and forth for about 45 minutes. Literally, I remember it. It was around 45 minutes, and I, we debriefed it after. I said, do you see what happened there? I mean, witness blown. You know, you're on my staff. This just... But when you, have, when you do that, you know, when you try and hit it out, you're, you're just trying to stir up more trouble, right? It always causes more trouble. And so it doesn't work. You can't walk out. That doesn't work. Hitting it out, you don't really care about the relationship. The one that works is when you talk it out. That's the third. You talk it out. And this type does care about the relationship. Now, a counseling technique, when you go to marriage counseling, typically they'll say what is very healthy for a couple to do is to not think about what you're going to say when you're in an argument. You know when you're arguing? You're not even listening to what they're saying. You're just thinking of what you want to say next when they take a breath, right? So they call it the the jack-in-the-box method. So you go up to the drive-thru in Jack in the Box, and there's Jack, right? And you start talking to Jack, the person inside, and you say, hey, I'd like to have a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. And then they say back, okay, is that two tacos and a happy, you know, and a water. No, 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 no water. I want Coke, not water. Okay, a Coke? Yes, Coke. And then you want a cheeseburger and fries. Okay, so you, wanna, you want some fries, a Coke, and a hamburger. No, 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 okay, cheeseburger. I want cheese on the bur- hamburger. Oh, okay, che- then they, cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke? Yes, cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. Okay, pull up to the window. They never get it the first time, do they? Because you can't hear it through the squawk box, right? And so this is what you're supposed to do in marriage when you're working through things. Seek to understand where the other person is coming from. And so you, you say, what did you hear me say? When it starts getting heated, go, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. what did you hear me say? And they tell you, and you go, I didn't say that. It's not at all what I said. Well, then tell me what you did say. Say that. Now what did you hear me say? I heard you say this. No, well, when I said this, okay, what did you hear me just say? And you come to grips until you come together, right? It works, jack-in-the-box works great in any relationship that you've got because you're not seeking, you're not seeking to win the fight, the argument. You're seeking to understand where the other person is coming from. And that's, that's a game changer right there. So talking it out is the way to go. All right, actor number one, a rich fool. In walks actor number two, an intelligent, beautiful woman. I like this part. Verse 3, his wife's name was Abigail. Nabal's wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. Verse 14, one of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greeting, but Nabal hurled insults at him, at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time that we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. The whole time, we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over, Abigail, and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. So Nabal and Abigail are not two peas in a pod, right? Totally different. I mean, their temperament, their attitudes, their philosophy, their demeanors, totally opposite of each other. 
Anyone here married to someone opposite? Any opposite? Typically, opposites seem to attract because you make a good team, right? Uh, and sometimes it, you have to say sorry about that, you know. But there, there's a concept called jerk syndrome. Jerk syndrome is that some women uh, identify themselves as jerk magnets. They go, I don't know why. I seem to attract all these weird guys. How, how does that happen? I'm like, well, there's a long list of why that happens, <laughs> right? But... But how often do you see this intelligent, beautiful woman, and then she, her husband's with her at the party, and you go, how in the world? I mean, people used to say that to my late wife all the time, but I, I have a good self-esteem, so I didn't even listen to what they said. You know? <laughs> Verse 25, it says, please, Abigail says, please, David, David, pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. I don't know if it's wise for you to call your husband a wicked man to other people, but she's doing it because right? it he's trying to, she's trying to save their lives, basically. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. When the Lord has fulfilled uh, for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him, so she's talking to David, um, and appointed him ruler over Israel. So she's reminding him at this point of of the fact that God has already anointed him as the next king of Israel, right? Already done that. She's reminding him, don't mess that up, David. Verse 31 says, My Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And so she is reminding him that if you take meaningless bloodshed here just because you're ticked off at his answer and he won't help you out, God's not going to honor that. And that's not where you want to go, is it? That's not your goal. She's just reminding him, and it seems to work. Let me give you uh, four ways to win over anger here. The first one that we see here with Abigail is ignore petty disagreements. Ignore petty disagreements. Most of the big fights we get into with another person started with small stuff that we couldn't work out. You, You see that in your life? Start with small things. So ignore those petty disagreements. Look at Proverbs. It says the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it even breaks out. And again, Proverbs says, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger. And it is his glory to, watch this, overlook a transgression. All right? Now, most of us want to, when we get in situations, we want to act differently, and we all wish that we had, we had a trunk monkey, right? Watch, watch this. Real commercial. Suburbans. Check it out. You don't like the way oh. I drive? What, you don't like the way oh. I drive? many of you need a trunk monkey? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I was in San Diego the last two days, and uh, coming back yesterday, I was so, when I got home, I was, my hands were still on this gripping the steering wheel. These people, how, you, people, so, sorry, Lord, forgive me. For, <laughs> oh, wow. Ignore petty agree- disagreements. Number two, keep a close check on your speech. Proverbs says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word will stir up anger. How you respond, that first response is important. A gentle answer turns away the wrath. They're trying to start a fight. It takes two people to fight, doesn't it? Yeah, one person yelling is a madman, right? So a gentle answer will turn away wrath, where a harsh word just stirs up more anger, right? That's that's what happens. and, And once you get those first words out, you can't put them back. You start that fight with, like, my friend, <laughs> when he responded the way he did, oh, that just escalated quick, right? I had a guy, when I was uh, in Germany, we were taking some junior hires, we took them into the French Alps to go skiing, and one of my staff guys, this soldier, he, this, these kids, this one kid was being really rude to all these girls on the bus, and so when we stopped at this, uh, this Burger King in France, a Burger King, right, stop at a Burger King, and I saw him over there. I go, Trey, what are you doing? I, I'll tell you later. And I just watched him. He, he went to his bag, and he got out his toothpaste, and he, he told the kid, and the kid starts 
squeezing out all of the stuff on, on the paper on the table, all the toothpaste. And then he got a little spoon, and Troy hands it to him. He goes, now put it back in. He goes, I can't. It won't go back in. He goes, try. And Troy's just getting stern with him. And Troy is a nice, you know, lollipop kind of guy. So he's getting stern. The kid's like wide-eyed. And the kid starts crying because he's trying to put it back in. He goes, try. Keep doing it. And he just said to him, he said, once a word comes out of your mouth, you can't put it back. So the first words, a gentle answer will turn away wrath if you're thinking that way up front. But a harsh word is just going to stir up more anger. And number three, be honest in your communication. Proverbs 27 says, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Better speak up if you need to in love rather than concealing uh, concealing things, saying that I just don't want to hurt the relationship. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So if a friend wounds you, that means they confronted you on something that they see in your life. Um, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. All right, so we've got to be honest in our communication. So uh, a husband and wife go to counseling, right? They're having, having problems. And the husband's not getting it. And the counselor's like, the husband's just not getting it, dude. You're not seeing. The wife is expressing some serious stuff here, and you, it's, he just doesn't get it, right? So the counselor thought to himself, I've got to help him. So he asked the wife, he said, Will you stand up? She stands up. Husband's still seated. Counselor walks over to her, plants his lips on hers, and stays there for like 10 seconds. That's a long time. And he's kissing her. And when he stopped, the wife had this smile on her face. And he says to the husband, do you see that smile on her face? This is all she needs from you. This is all she needs to put that smile every day on her face. She needs this every day. Do you understand now? And the husband looks at him and says, I, I think I do. Yeah, I, I the problem is, though, I can bring her in here on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, <laughs> but Tuesday and Thursday, I've got... <laughs> be honest with your needs and be smart with your words. Sometimes we're honest with our needs, but the way we say it to the other person, that starts a little angry because they start feeling like you're accusing them of things. Be honest with your needs, but be smart with your words too. Make sense? All right, number four, don't let anger build up. Ephesians chapter four says, in, in your anger, do not sin. Notice what it just said. In your anger, do not sin. It just said that I can be angry and that's not sinful at times. Anger can be sin. How does anger turn into sin? Look at the rest of the sentence. It says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Why? Because it will ferment like a bottle of wine. And you wake up the next day, and then the next day if you don't deal with it, and it keeps fermenting. And now that anger turns into all kinds of nasty things that take you down. It says, do not give the devil a foothold. Remember that word foothold is the word, Greek word topos. We get topographical map from that. He's saying, don't give the devil a specific height and location and specific spot on the map of your life to enter into your life and do all kinds of other damage. Don't give them that one spot, that topos, that foothold. And that's what anger, when you don't resolve it today, you sleep on it, it doesn't go away. You might think, oh, tomorrow's a new day. No, no, you're still, you're still gonna deal with the same stuff. Still gonna deal with the same stuff. People think that Jesus was angry when he turned over the, uh, the tables in the temple, remember? They were buying and selling, and he got infuriated or righteous anger, so to speak, because they turned God's house in, into a thing where they're just buying and making money. And it says that he turned over the tables, and you'll see Jesus got angry. No, I want you to notice something. It says specifically that Jesus sat there when he saw what was happening. He, his heart broke, and he sat there, and he fashioned a cord. You know what that means? He fashioned a cord in the Middle East. You would take strips of leather and you would tie it together and then you'd take another one and loop it through and tie that together and you'd take a whole bunch of these leather strips and tie them together. That takes time, doesn't it? 
That takes time. And then he took him on the, it would hook on the table, and then he yanked the tape off. (laughs) I walked on water almost. Uh, So it took him a lot of time to fashion the cord. He was thoughtful, okay? He wasn't just irate, oh, what are you guys doing? Bah! He thought through it. So there's a righteous anger. He was upset of, for God's sake, right? And then he did something about it right now. If he took that little bit of anger that we saw, right, not sinful anger, but normal anger, and he slept on it night after night after night and did nothing on it, well, then it can turn into something else. But it doesn't have to if you do the right stuff. So we have actor number one, a rich fool. Actress number two, we have an intelligent, beautiful woman. And last but not least, in comes actor number three, a handsome, angry man. Verse 21, David had just said, it's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with me ever so severely if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. Do you see what Nabal's servants were saying? We're in jeopardy here. Not just Nabal, but his whole household. That's what David just said. He was going to wipe out everything that belonged to Nabal. David is set on taking revenge. And remember, we always have a choice to either take revenge or make amends. That's why the game show is called that. Listen to this. An 83-year-old man was in line at a McDonald's drive-thru, and here's what he says. He says, the young lady behind me leaned on her horn and started mouthing some ugly words because I was taking too long to place my order. So when I got to the first window, I paid for her order along with mine. The cashier must have told her what I had done because as we moved forward in the line, Uh, She leaned out of her window and was waving to me and mouthing, thank you, thank you, thank you, probably feeling like embarrassed that I had repaid her rudeness with kindness. He says, when I got to the second window, I showed the server both receipts, and I took her food too. (laughs) Now she had to go back to the end of the queue and start all over in the drive through line again. Moral to the story, he said, don't blow your horn at old people. We've been around for a long time. (laughs) So David is all set on on taking revenge. Wait, 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 wait. He's going to what? He's all set on taking revenge against Nabal. Wait, hold the phone. Wait, wait, wait. How in the world can David be so, so patient with King Saul and not enacting revenge, but now Nabal does this, and David goes right to revenge. How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happens. What was David doing? He was protecting his men. He was sticking up for his employees because they're his responsibility. You stand up for your employees, right? That's what what you do. I'll tell you, my Uncle George lived in, um, in Glendale. He's passed away recently, but he worked for uh, Disney, 29 years, and he was the one who would just go in with Michael Eisner, and he made the entire Indiana Jones ride. He made the entire People Mover ride. He did all the Paris. Th- he was just one guy, comes in, Michael Eisner, yeah, okay, I like that, send it to production. Then he'd go and get his team and do it. That, that's a pretty valuable player, right? At 29 years and however many, 10 months, Michael Eisner calls him into the office and says, hey, we're going to have to let you go tomorrow. George, sorry about that. Um, Just that 30-year pension is just ridiculous, high, and they didn't want to pay it. He said, so we're going to fire you tomorrow, and I want you to bring your, uh, what you'd like us to pay you hourly as a consultant because he just wants them to continue working for him. Is that, is that, that, that's not right, is it? No. I've got another friend who, uh, who made the, from Illinois, came out here to build the LAX uh, Hilton Hotel. It was the biggest hotel, uh, Hilton Hotel in the world at the time. He oversaw the whole project, got it all set, and then had all the staff running, and they had the penthouse up top. Um, he actually, I actually bought them a movie tickets one time to go to the movies, and I took a date up there to watch the planes land. It was a really cool area. I used to be pretty creative. What happened to me? 
But so he, when he finished building that, it took years. They said, hey, we're going to have to let you go because you were right at the 29-year mark working with us. I guess the 30-year pensions are ridiculous, right? 20 versus 30. How can you do that as a company when someone's been so loyal to you, right? So here we've got right or wrong, David is consumed with this anger, right, until Abigail reminds him uh, that following his anger is not, gonna, is not what God called him to do. It's not going to go well. Verse 32, it says, David said to Abigail, praise, praise be the Lord who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from, you know, avenging myself with my own hands. So David is thrilled with Abigail stepping up to the plate. And let me uh, close by giving you a couple of benefits to making amends versus taking revenge. Benefit one, it provides healing. When you make amends with someone, you heal the relationship. When you take revenge, you separate it even further than it was originally, right? So, so it can provide healing. In James chapter 5, we looked at this before, but it says, is anyone among you afflicted? He should pray. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So you pray to God if you want forgiveness, right? Notice the second part, verse 16. Confess to one another, therefore, your faults. You may so that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. So if you want forgiveness, you pray to God. But if you want healing, you've got to tell someone else. You've got to share with someone else. You've got to go ask forgiveness from someone else. That's where emotional healing is because we live in the physical realm here, right? And forgiveness from God, we deal with that. But if you want healing, you've got to deal with your fellow man. I went to San Diego the last two days and I... Uh, had just made amends about a month ago with a friend that we had been at odds for maybe nine years and something happened and left a rift, but we were like brothers and it just, we just stay apart. And I had for five or six years on my items to do on my phone, text Dennis and tell him everything's fine because I harbored nothing against him and I, I held that back. And when I said that to him on the phone, he starts crying, and he starts asking for me to forgive him. And we cried for about 45 minutes ta as we talked. We just couldn't help it. The beauty of getting rid of your junk, I mean, you get rid of that stuff. It's trash can theology. All right, leads me into my next point. It paves a healthy future, number two. Trash can theology is when the trash, <laughs> when I was single, all right, I had 50 permanent address changes before I got married. Okay, I had a lot of roommates. Guys are slobs. The trash can gets full, and the guys just make it so that it can go all the way up in an A-frame until someone's going to take it out. But then, inevitably, someone puts something on there, and it falls off on the floor, right? And then everything starts in chain reaction. God made us that way. We're like trash cans because we, we can only hold a certain amount. And you've got to do cleaning. You've got to take out your trash once in a while. Or, or someone says something to you, husband and wife, he just says, uh, how was your day? What did you say? Like, she says, trash can has been full for a while, right? And the littlest thing that means nothing really just sets off this torrent of stuff, right? If you try and hold a beach ball under, in a pool under the water, okay, you can do it for a little bit, but eventually it's going to pop up somewhere else, you know, and make a big splash. And when you do that, you, you keep things in your life. You bottle them up. It's going to pop up somewhere else. And you might think, well, what happened there? Well, it came from over here. And it's normally unresolved problems that you deal with. Watch the healthy story end here. This is beautiful because it paves the way for a healthy future in verse 39. When David heard that Nabal was dead... He sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. Don't tell me there's no God. I mean, look at the, the situation. David doesn't take revenge. He makes amends. He's fine with it. And, and then God allows the husband to die, and he gets the beautiful, intelligent woman. Come on. This is a great show, folks. I mean, 
And last but not least, number three, it, it prevents bitterness. All right, benefits to making amends, it's going to prevent bitterness. Garth Brooks, old song, We Bury the Hatchet, and you know it. Some of the words say this, we've got enough on each other to wage a full-scale war if we could ever remember what we're fighting for. We bury the hatchet, but leave the handle sticking out. We're always digging up things we should forget about. When it comes to forgiving, honey, there ain't no doubt, we bury the hatchet, but leave the handle sticking out. <laughs> Why used to leave the handle sticking out? So that you can take it and use it again against the person. Guys, that's, that's, not, the way, that's not the way to do that, right? You got to prevent, because listen, when you leave the handle sticking out, it leads to bitterness. And bitterness is a prison. Because when you're bitter against someone else, ugh, Typically, you're the only one that knows you're bitter. The other person doesn't even know there's a conflict. They're free as a lark. And you're letting that jerk, you thought, control you by staying bitter. It only hurts you. There is a staircase if we refuse to forgive. Look at the staircase here. Top, the top step says offense. When you get offended, you've got to talk it out. If you don't and you sleep on it overnight, it can turn into resentment. And notice that if forgiveness is not given at each step along the way, the next step will be unavoidable. Then the resentment turns into more hatred. When you got hatred in your heart, then you want to hold a grudge. No, I'm not going to. do. And then the grudge turns into total revenge. Now, last thing I'm going to say here is that I want to free you up for a second, okay? I want to free you, and it really will be. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, right? Notice you know, love is patient, love is kind, love does not want. Every single thing in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, every single thing that it mentions are behavioral patterns. They are not feelings. That's huge. Why? Because God tells me I have to act in a loving way toward everybody, everyone. But I don't have to like everyone. You are freed up to say, I don't... This person rubs me wrong, and I might rub them wrong. You don't have to like them in order to act in a loving way toward them. That's really freeing, folks, isn't it? I mean, because some of you, I just can't even. You know, I love you, though. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Rick to come up and read the last uh, verse for us and then lead us in communion. So you've got your uh, communion cups under your table? You grab those. Well, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks a lot about uh, how his followers are to relate to God and to relate to one another. <clears throat> relationships, reconciled relationships are key in Jesus' message. And in Matthew 5, 23 through 24, Jesus says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go, first go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Note that that verse talks about when you realize that you've done something wrong, when you've wronged somebody. You're the person, uh, the offender, right? And Jesus says that we should seek forgiveness from that person and restore the relationship. We, need to must, we must remember that we too have offended and sinned uh, God, or sinned against God. Right? We have sinned and, and, and damaged uh, the relationship that we have. But this is why we have Jesus, and this is why he died on the cross for us. Through his sacrifice, he reconciled us to the one that we offended, to God the Father. And we celebrate that reconciled relationship when we partake in communion. And so at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Please partake in receiving of the bread. Well, after that, Jesus, he took the cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood, new covenant, and it's poured out 
for the forgiveness of sins. Please receive the cup. Would you stand as we as we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you that through your death and resurrection, we have been reconciled to the Father. We thank you that you have made a way for us to have a right relationship, a reconciled relationship with God. We thank you for your love and for your great mercy that has washed us clean and brought us into fellowship into your kingdom. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the king of my heart be the man where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my soul let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my soul you are
so so a needle sewing thread. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I'm gonna say a phrase and you complete the other half of it if you know it. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Do you believe that? He really is. He really, when it doesn't look like it, he's just in process. The cake is still in the oven, right? Uh, let me just tell you that if, if God's touched your heart at all today, we have a prayer patio out here. The door's open right now. Just sneak out there. Let some folks pray with you, you know, about whatever God's laid on your heart, wants you to deal with. Um, but also want to let you know in the lobby, there's a women's ministries table with a lot of events coming and the Seder. You can sign up at the info table if you want or online, but make sure you look at those announcements and, uh, and sign up appropriately. Amen? Amen? Hey, have a great week. God bless you.